Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, some of you are not smiling, please just show what you ever you're working with. 32, 22, 12, 2, it don't matter, just smile. And David says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. In other words, the first thing that you need before you get your suit right, your car right, and your money right, when you're coming to worship is your attitude. Amen. See, see, that old preacher will get make you happy about you. See, I wasn't there on Sunday when God touched your life. I wasn't there with you on Monday when God locked that thing. I wasn't with you on Tuesday when your child touched that life. I wasn't with you last night when God did you say, By the time we come to church, listen here, when we come over now, by the time we get here, we're not coming to get anything. See, you, you, you don't need church to worship. You have lemons in your mouth. 
you are telling the world and the angels that God is not that good. That's why the Bible says God dwells in the praises of his people. Because when we praise him, we affirm that he is all that he says he is. I'm going to preach on something here today. I, I appreciate you musicians for the song and the singing. I don't know how some of you come to church and just sit there. Amen. Some of us never went to clubs, so church is our club. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> it is. It's amazing that you act like you never went where you were. You, you remember when you used to go to the club, you got happy before you got to the club. <laughs> You had to just put in your clothes together. That's what church should be. <laughs> I was glad when the said out of me, let us. Since you gotta have your happy before you put on, before like it's gone, we're gonna party. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this moment. I'm grateful that Lord now the time has come for you to take your place. I ask your God to use me as you have never used me before. I pray that my Savior may receive maximum glory in this place. And please drop upon this anticipating audience the gift of maximum growth. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And amen. Again. Um, come with me to the book of Exodus chapter 14. I really want to thank God for your pastor for the invitation. Uh, the administrator of the church, I don't know who she is, but she must be a walker somewhere. Uh, she is a very powerful person. And I just want to thank all of you for uh, the niceness and the beauty and the wonderfulness of this church. We have heard great things about you, and surely, truly, it is true that what they say is true about you. You are a good, great church with a great pastor. Somebody say amen. amen. Thank God for you. We pray for his healing. Pray that he comes back. He's one of our very, very special uh, pastor in North America. He's one of a kind. Yeah. Ain't nobody like him. He is our next mother. We can see somebody say amen. He has a very special calling upon his life. Don't get him to preach a prophecy and preach all the other stuff. No, let him preach what he's preaching. He was raised for such a time as this. We thank God for him. And we truly are humble. All of his colleagues, we know him for one thing. And we're grateful for that one thing that he's doing. You're blessed to have it. Love it. Love, love on your pastor. Can I say that? Yeah. The Adventists don't know how to love on their pastor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They just come to fight over that. <laughs> and if any other church member is trying to mess up your pastor, tell them, look, you may mess him up, but he's my pastor. You don't mess up with my pastor. You, you gotta say that. Yeah, some people need to hear. That's just what it is. Members need to talk to members. Once in a while, you need to kick the pastor out and sit in the locker room of your church and say, look, we want to grow as a church. And this person is the one to take us where we want to go. We are not going to put up with that. The day the church will do that, you'll be amazed that will be larger than T.D. Jakes Church. But as long as people can say anything and nobody says that's wrong, Chapter 40, let's get into it. Here it is. I just wanted Jamie to feel good wherever he is. And I believe he's watching, so he may bring me back next week. Amen. Yes. <laughs> chapter 14 from verse 1 through 4. It reads Exodus chapter 14, verse 1 through 4. It reads, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Piharoth, between Midgar and the sea. Opposite Baal Zephon, you shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, They are bewildered by the land, and the wilderness has caused them here. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart, so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt. Leave it right there. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, and he told him, Look, I want you to go speak to the people, and tell them to turn and part their horses, their feet, 
that don't get their cattle by this uh, place where the mountain is on the right and the sea is in front of them and there's a small opening where they could see where they came from. And so God is telling Moses to tell the people to sit down and, and, and then God says this is not just another situation. I want you to understand that I have a purpose that I have behind uh, this act. I wanted them to feel their resting, but I'm going to a working Pharaoh to come after them. In other words, I want him angry enough in order for him to get fired up enough for him to come after the people of God. In fact, I want to motivate his coming after you as my failure. I told you I'm taking you to the other side, but I want Pharaoh to think that I wasn't God enough that you were messed up and confused in the land. And I'm going to do it that Pharaoh will come with his best, and when he gets here, I want to get some glory for myself. I just want to get a testimony that I am the Lord. And the Bible says it was told Pharaoh, you know the story, Pharaoh was told, Pharaoh was furious, and he got 600 best chariots, not only the weak ones, but the best itinerary that he had. He called on his minister or secretary of defense, and he said, give me everything we got. We know how bad this God is. He brought in some uh, 10 uh, uh, missiles or weapons of mass destruction, and he messed us up with lies, darkness, uh, frogs, and law. Us. This God is bad, so we need to go after his people with all that we got. And the Bible says he got everything he had, and they led, and he led to where he thought the people were. And as he got close, the Bible says the people heard the churning and the moving of the chariot wheels, and they knew who they were. And they ran to Moses and they said, Look here, we're told you leave us alone. We know it was bad, but it was better for us to be buried there. Please take us there. And Moses talked to God. And God said, Look here, why do you bother me? Just tell the people to go forward. And I've always wondered why God gives us assignments that are difficult to accomplish. Why would you tell Moses to tell the people? Why did he just tell the people? <laughs> See, I don't know about you, but I have no questions for this God that I serve. I've discovered that the closer you get to him, the more questions you have for him. And the more questions you have for God, he ain't going to answer none. <laughs> instead of an explanation. Yes. Well, I'm going to take you to a place here today because many of us want to hear God say something and, and people say this thing. Well, God said this to me. I was in the shower and God said this to me. Stop lying on him. <laughs> it sounds good. It makes you look more spiritual, but you mess up those of us who are less spiritual because we've never heard from God like that. Somebody say that he is never boom, he is never into our bedroom, they never tapped us on the shoulder. No, no, no. But we believe he still speaks to us. Amen, amen, amen. So God says to Moses, go tell the people to part. The cops and the people say, well, that's good. We've been walking for a while. Let's cheer for a little while. And then here comes Pharaoh. And now the people run to Moses, not to God. Let me tell you something. It is a very painful thing to be spiritual leader. Only those who are not called to be spiritual leaders want to be spiritual leaders. Anybody who God has ever called, in fact, wrestled with God, refused to do it. Moses told God, I can't even speak. Leave me alone. Anybody that God wanted to do anything spectacular through, they reason with God because when God puts you on his agenda, he doesn't show and yet he demands absolute obedience to his will. Amen. Amen. If it was me leading me, that's a better deal. It's me leading you. <laughs> and the last time I checked, you had your mind. The last time I checked, you are suspicious of anybody who tells you anything on behalf of God. <laughs> if anyone gets up and says, the Lord told me, you're like, oh, oh, oh. If the Lord 
really wanted me to know about it, he would have told me the exact. And many people love, love the benefits of being spiritual leaders. They love the bright lights and all the stage. And, but I tell you, the process of being used by God will change your life. You are so associated with God that people cannot punish God, but they can punish God through you. And I used to think people don't like me. Then I discovered, no, they don't like God. And I am just the physical representation of what they hate. And so when they hit me, they feel like God's going to get it. And, and now I know God truly gets it. So Moses, go talk to the people that hear this. And everything comes together. I want to talk to somebody in this place who God pulled you out of some place. And God promised you some things. And instead of you enjoying those things, you feel like you are in a place between the hard place and the rock, the rock and the hard place. There you are, where God was supposed to take you to the place where milk and honey is flowing all over the place, but it appears as if there's a sea before you, there's a mountain by your side, watch this, and you are there because God said, be there. Some of the places we don't want to be, brothers and sisters, sometimes you, where you are is the perfect will of God for you in order for God to get the glory that he wants to get to you from his enemies. If God was to say yes to all of your prayer requests, none of us would never be anything that God wants us to be. The Bible says it was not Moses thinking, it was not Aaron's thinking, it was not Miriam's singing, it was God himself who told Moses, I want my people between the sea and the mountain, it was God. It's true when he says my thoughts are not your thoughts, my plans are not your plans. In other words, here's what I've discovered. I've been telling my church this. The most painful thing about God's will, you ready for this? Let me give it to you. The most painful thing about God's will. See, people talk about, I want God's will to be done. I want God's will. Let me tell you the most painful thing about God's will. You ready for this? The most painful thing about God's will is the fact that it's His will. That's the most difficult thing you ever about it. It's His will, not mine. So I have an opinion on what God wants me to do. But what I've discovered, His will is His will. I just want somebody to relax a little bit. Wherever you are, but however tough it is, sometimes it is where God wants you to be. God here, Joseph and Mary here, we're carrying the sake of the world. And yet the Bible says there was no room for them in the end. And they were in the manger. And that's exactly where God wanted them to be. Yes, Come here, thief on the cross. Well, I am condemned. I'm going to die. Well, you are hanging on the right of Jesus the Christ. And before you bring this, he's last. You're going to make your request known out to God. And God himself is going to grant it to you before you die. You are on the cross next to Jesus. That's exactly where God wanted you to be. Come over here, a little girl, the woman at the well. How well is new? I gotta go all by myself. Nobody should see me going to the well. And you find a man sitting on the well, sitting right on top of the well. You cannot get the water unless you go through him. Well, I thought he is the wrong guy. Well, sister, you are at the right place. See, I've discovered now that it's no longer what I want to be out of, but it's who I become wherever God wants me to be. It's not the love sense that I learned. It's who I become in the place of His perfect will that's going to qualify me for the next level. God is not about what I know. God is about what I become. Because if I Nobody can take away from me. See, God is not taking you through whatever you're going through for you to learn a lesson. God is taking you through whatever you're going through for you to become something. 
Anything that you've been through and it didn't kill you, it made you something. And stop denying that you're changing. The other day I was talking to my daughters and, and we had uh, somebody had posted in, I think one of my pastor friends behind me was very notorious, and he put this picture of me when I was young. Well, I'll show you. When I was 20. <laughs> I remember it was my birthday on that day, and, and, and so he had this picture on Facebook. So I pulled it up, pulled down, and, and then I said to myself, let me look at myself. <laughs> I took the pictures before when I was young, four or five, all the way to the one I have now. And you know what thing I discovered? I changed. <laughs> and I'm just saying this for somebody who's in this place that no matter what the enemy tells you, you, my friend, have the ability to change. Yeah. Just go pull up your high school prom picture and take your wedding picture and take your current picture. You're going to see some differences. You, my friend, it's only the devil who can lie to you that you will never change. That's a lie. You, my friend, God has wired you to become more than what you are because change is part of who we are. Oh, God, coming from a God who is unchangeable. <laughs> It was in yesterday, today, and forever. But as for me, I thank God I'm not the same today as I was yesterday. Anybody glad about it? And I'm so grateful that my tomorrow is brighter than my today because I'm hopeful that he who is to come shall change me at the twinkling of an eye and I shall never look like what I ever looked like. <laughs> so the story that I have there back there, I want us to remind somebody that it's very amazing that when you look at the story, a few things jump up. God has a way of accomplishing unusual things. Amen. If you hang around with God, you're going to discover that God has got this thing of accomplishing unusual things. He has this thing of accomplishing unlikely things. He has this thing of accomplishing unthinkable things. Yeah. When you hang around God, just expect the unlikely, just expect the, 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 the unthinkable to become a reality in your life because God says, uh, don't you know you not doing anything is going to cause Pharaoh to come after you. And when he gets around, I want you to understand that I'm going to get glory for myself. God, from this story you discover, he is more than able to, to overcome your past. Pharaoh thought that there were still slaves. <laughs> See, the Pharaoh was motivated to come after what was. When the Passover took place and the angel passed over the blood post, that was the end of what was. They matched out of Egypt under what is. And Pharaoh followed them over what was. He didn't know that God overcomes your past. Yeah. Now learn that when God changes you, Paul says, if any man be in Christ Jesus, they are not a modified, improved individual. They become a brand new creation. In other words, what was ends with Christ, and what is begins with Christ, and the devil always comes for what was, and many of us are too panicking on stuff that the devil can't change, can't do nothing, because it is in the past. We are under new management. Yeah. Uh, I love it when I drive around my city and I see the same apartment complexes where people used to go and stay there. And, and in order for them to motivate to have new clientele, they put on this wonderful thing under new management. And you know people become hopeful because it's new management. They never change anything. <laughs> But simply because it says under new management, new cars are coming in, they've got root, uh, rebounds and balloons and, and all this fanfare and food, free food, under new management. And I want you to understand that when God saved you, you are under new management. Nothing touches you without His permission. All right. Anything he permits to go, you go through, it is 
to change you so that you become everything that you qualified for when he saved you. In other words, let me put the message a little bit. What it is is this, whenever you come to God, when you come to God, you get everything that you must have. The moment you say to Jesus, you're my Savior, you get everything that you must have. You become everything you must be. And then the next thing, you start becoming what you are. I miss my church, I went over here. <laughs> So you say Christ and he gives you 100%. Yes. But the day after that, now we call it sanctification, I think that's what we call it, which is a process of a lifetime. What sanctification simply means is you are becoming what you are. When my daughter was born, she was born a baby and yet she was 100% woman. Yeah. As we fed her and did what we had to do, and she slept and played and all. Now she's becoming, every day she became what she is. All right. All right. But everything, oh, it is, the Bible says he has made everything beautiful in his time. Right. What that means now is you've got 100% everything God wants you to have, but you need to mature into that thing. Get a good idea, right? Because if you get it before time, you will wreck that thing. And so what God says is keep on walking with me. And so now that's why he is. That's why in the life of a believer, as soon as you start obeying God, God will put you in situations where you don't know what's going on. Because God is maturing you into the faith that you've already agreed to, but you don't know yet how it looks like. That's why then Paul says, when we get it right, then we know that all things work together. They don't have to be good, but all things work together for them who are, are called by God and love God. In other words, no, nothing shall separate me from the love of God. Why? Because everything I'm going, Paul says, I learn to be content. I can do all things. And then Paul says, in everything, give thanks. Because you are becoming what you already are. You may cry sometimes, but it ain't in cry. crying unto death. It is crying unto growth. I just wish we knew our God. If we knew our God, you have your best deaths on your worst day. If we knew that God, there's no shadow of turning in Him. I'm telling you right now, I don't care what your life looks like. You will still thank God because my life being messed up does not mean my God is messed up. I mean, my God is still my God. And nothing, he doesn't if nothing changes who He is. Nothing improves who He is. He is just God. He just is. And whatever is happening in my life is a privilege. It's an opportunity for me to watch the draw of redemption being played in my life. See, see. That's why when... <sighs> see, see. That's why the Bible says this is eternal life. That they may know you. Huh? Just to know God, eternal life. Yeah. Not being vegetarian, not sleeping around, all that. No, no, no. No God. Amen. Just to know God. Yes. You can go anywhere, and your character is as steady and stable. Amen. Whilst your flesh is screaming and crying. So here there's God of the country past, you discover that. And then the other thing you discover is that God takes us where we are. He takes us where we are. I'm going to preach on the subject just for the next few minutes and I'm going to get, 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 get bored. Let you go eat. Black folk want to eat then. <laughs> I'm preaching on the subject, the odds are for you. The odds are for you. Now that we know that God does, accomplishes unusual things, unlikely things, 
That's when we read through scripture, there's nobody who had God ever used who was qualified. Because God uses unlikely things. I mean, unlikely. I mean, you, you, you're, not, you, you're not getting what I'm saying. I'm talking about unlikely. There are some people with pedigree. They really feel somebody ought to know them. But, but God uses unlikely. In other words, everything that God ever created is useful for the best purposes of whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it. Without any permission from anybody. So that's why for me, I, I know I, that's what the Bible says, envy not. I'm not envious of nobody because I know I may be the unlikely next time. Yeah. I, I don't need to be to be able, I don't need no qualification. God simply specializes in unlikely stuff. Yeah. And usual things, that's what God does. Stuff that you don't even think works, that's what God needs. Yeah. So the book says, he said, oh, go up there. I want to get glory for myself. And I want you to understand one thing, just as working on this thing before I can get where I really want to go. Sometimes you need to get to a point where you let God have freedom to be God in your life. Amen. When you read this story, we all know the Red Sea, we all know that. We, we love, he made a way, all that kind of stuff. Our problem is we think that he made the way a way for us. The whole Red Sea story had nothing to do with you. It's in the Bible. Read the word. You ready? Verse 4. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. I will gain, watch this, I will gain honor yeah. over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. He didn't save them for them. He saved them for himself. <laughs> See, many of us are not growing spiritually because we think everything is about us. God, if God could have an addiction, here it is, it could be you know, his addiction to his glory. God cares about God more than God cares about you. Oh, I don't expect any name on that because he, 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 all of our songs, he knows my name, do you know his? God blesses you for his glory. God doesn't work for us. So it was a good idea, so he sits on his child, he works for me. No, no, no. God created you for his purpose. He doesn't exist for your purpose, you exist for his purpose. That's why he says, before I formed you, I knew you. I called you by name. I ordained you. In other words, you were born because I already had work for you. Yeah. You are here because there's a purpose that only you can accomplish for me, not for you. If it blesses you, that's a residue. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's just a residue. It, it ain't. I remember my, my grandmother used to do this. You know, this uh, African uh, grandmother of us. She used to bake some cake. We don't know what the name of the cake was. It was just a heavy cake, and some of you can identify with it. It was a cake that when you get one piece of the cake, you would spend the whole day drinking water. <laughs> and anybody remembers those days, our grandmothers and mothers who would do something with anything. I mean, today we need a recipe, we need some ingredients. No, 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 no. My grandmother just used whatever was in the kitchen. And she would throw it together, and this thing was it. And she had this thing, I'll call it pound cake for the sake of imagination. <laughs> and she would pull this thing together, and, and uh, being her grandson, uh, the very first one, I would be next to her, and she would do this thing, mix up these things, and, and, and once in a while she would allow me just to take a little bit of, of whatever this was, pound cake. And I would take it. And then, because she was a great grandmother, at the end of the day, after she had put everything in the pan or in the pot where she was going to put some coals on top and all that kind of good stuff, then she would let me have the ball. Yes. Anybody remembers the figure? <laughs> oh, it was a good time. It, it was a mighty good time. And all you had to do was call somebody. You know? But after a little while, after a little while, she would take it away from me. And I say, Grandma, I'm not done yet. And my grandma would say, you need to understand that this is residue. What I made for you is in the oven. 
And if you keep, if you overeat the residue, you get diarrhea. Yeah. <laughs> this was just for you to taste and let your appetite and imagination imagine what's coming out of the oven. And I want you to understand that whatever blessing God has given you, it's a residue. And if you overdo on the residue, you're going to suffer spiritually and physically. I don't care what your job is, thank God he got some money, residue. Thank God he got a good house, residue. Thank God all your children are good, residue. Thank God you have a name, residue. If your residue is this good, God, there has to be something contrary to what it's going to do. I'm just telling you right now, whenever Christ is, that's what the Bible says, is our ever-present help, where? In trouble. So if you pray trouble away, you're going to be far from God? The wine must run out so that Jesus can let you know, I, I can turn the water into wine. Lazarus must die first, preacher. So that I can let you know, I'm bad like that. I've got the resurrection and the life. And I just want somebody to understand that you need the odds you have. Daniel, come here. What is it, Pastor? Well, there's a lion's den. Well, those are the odds, but they are for you. What does that mean? Because in one day of God rescuing Daniel, read it again, Daniel chapter 6. All the enemies of Daniel were thrown in the pit at the same time. 100% removal of his enemy. You better start thanking God for things not working right for you. Because he's about to show up. He is so much God that the situation must be bad before he gets there. So that nobody says, maybe he has got some hand in this. And when he shows up, he simply says, show me where you put Lazarus. Yeah. And when he gets there, he puts his hands in his pocket, lest you think he's playing something on the rock. And he says, hey, move the rock. And all he has to do is say a little. He says, Lord, listen, you already heard me. But for their sake, you know, I need to pray a public prayer. But, but I know you already hooked me up. We, we're ready to roll this thing. But for the sake of the doctors of all here, let me just say a prayer so that they can repeat the prayer when they go home. And he calls him out, watch this, and in order for you not to say it, he puts something on it, he says, loose the man. <laughs> and when Lazarus was free and ready, he says to Lazarus, I'll oh, guide my donkey into Jerusalem. I don't know who it is who is sitting in this place today. Who thinks that God has walked away from you because of the odds against you. I want you to understand that the odds are literally for you. In fact, God hides the best among the odds. When God wants to do the most powerful thing, He drops it where nobody expects it to come from. Isaiah says Jesus was so common that his face never attracted nobody. Do you know that Jesus walked among men for 30 years and nobody knew he was Jesus? Till John says, Behold! Then I look at someone who says, Pastor, please, okay, you're right, come over here. After Jesus was exposed, immediately he was tempted. Before, behold, he could walk around man like he was a common man. I mean, God is this thing of hiding the very best of his stuff among the most common of things. That's why you should never look down on anybody. You should never talk down on anyone because you don't know who you are sitting next to. Now, I've been in America for a while now, and one thing I've discovered is that in America, we've got three types of black. Can I talk about it? Yeah. We all ain't black, black. <laughs> we have three types of black. We've got the African American black, that's the talk dog. <laughs> How do you know the attitude? <laughs> and the second black is the Caribbean black. <laughs> and the third black is the African.
and they're African black. <laughs> oh yeah, we just need to be in the same room. And how come you look weird and crazy when I do what I do as if there's nothing in you that looks like me? Oh. You know the most the most the most ridiculous thing is for a black person to say to your name, what's your name again? I heard some people say, well, you've got an accent, and I tell them, you're not international. <laughs> <laughs> because international people don't hear an accent. When you are international, you speak to communicate, not to amaze. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to China, you don't speak English like this. Chinese people, most of them, can't speak English. You need to break the English. You point at stuff. Yeah, that's there. What? I mean, you are trying to communicate. The more international you are, the more open-minded you are, and the more you appreciate diversity and unity and beauty. Listen, I passed you, 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 and one big-time lawyer said to me, you can't pass to me because you're African. Oh, I'm going to write a book. And he picked his wife and himself and they left the church. We went outside the church and started pulling everybody outside the church. Black on black. Kobe Bryant just died. And the video comes out. Somebody's talking about Kobe. You know the story. Oprah came yesterday crying a little bit. And you're thinking, what in the name of the name of the name? Would you bring that kind of foolishness at a time? Well, there's a wife who is to bury a husband and a daughter. I just want to understand, it's very, very important. When we do this Black History Month celebration, these moments must liberate us. We can't do this every year and we still have our issues. Africans are Africans, Caribbeans are, are Caribbean, and African Americans are African American brothers and sisters. Let me tell you, the day black folk will come together, unite for real, the world is going to see them in the And I thank God for our brothers and sisters that, who are here with us, our cousins, the white folk. We love you, because you know what? You're more open-minded than we are. I'm going to tell you, you pass the people five years, they can't even pronounce your name. Kambisi. I'm going to tell people, can you say Obama? Yes, Obama. Okay. If you say Obama, you can say Kambisi. It's attitude. The odds have to be against us. I'm telling you right now. I remember the time when I was invited to go to the U.S. Senate as, a, as an invited guest for me to walk through and see the very first uh, Supreme Court and where the foundation stone was laid down by our very first president. It was an amazing moment. And I'll tell you what, what made me to go there and do what I do is because I'm different. Your difference is make room for you. So of you still worried about my gift? No, 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 no. I'm good. Simply because I was a tall, handsome African. Come on, somebody. Somebody. <laughs> the odds are for you. Don't sit around and look at your history and look at yourself and complain about something that you never put into existence. You never made yourself black. Anybody who chose to be black here? Anybody chose to be born in Africa? I didn't choose my family. I didn't choose none of this stuff. I'm telling you, sometimes when I'm messed up with my own family, I look up at God and say, now, you better fix this thing. I didn't vote to be part of them. And some of them, I don't even like them. But he put me in that family. <laughs> you got to get to a certain point where you stop punishing you for things that you didn't choose. The Israelites didn't choose to be in this place. It is God who told them, go back there. So if any solution out of this place is going to come, it's not going to come from me. It's going to come from the one whose agenda it is that I'm sitting where I'm sitting. If God does not move this thing, then God is responsible for my perishing. It's a powerful thing to be a child of God. It's a powerful thing. I tell you, I've seen how powerful it is with my daughters every day. They just think they can get anything they want whenever they want. That's a power. I look at my kids.
things and I'm beginning to lean on God just looking at my kids. <laughs> it's a powerful thing. I mean, you know, Mary, you pay school fees, you know, chick school is expensive. You pay school fees, they don't care about that. And they're not spoiled, they're just being kids. Some things are just their rights. They must be heat in the house, lights must be on. Wherever you get the money to pay that thing, it's on you. <laughs> See, if my kids can trust me like that, <laughs> what about the God whose reputation is attached to my messed up self? <laughs> See, when I fail, I, listen, you can forgive me or I can run away from you, but I tell God every time, I fail your reputation on the line. What does that mean? You protect me, block some stuff, do whatever you gotta do. All I'm gonna do, it is what it is. When I was a young preacher, I used to hear people say, well, you need to look for God's will, preacher. And here's what I've discovered. The fastest way to discover God's will is to be you. Yeah. <laughs> because here's the deal. You can't even please God without God pleasing himself through you. Jesus puts it this way, without me you can do. Amen. So here it is. I'm not going to read the Bible to find the will of God, read the other Bible to find now. I just believe God in this situation, the best thing for me to do is this. But you have permission to block it, to move it, but I'm moving. Then the Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Amen. What that means now is that good man must be willing to move his feet so that God can order his steps. Amen. Some of you, you are playing God too much. That's why you're not enjoying God. You have played God so much that you think you're more than what you are. <laughs> it, have you ever heard of people who can, man, you can't embarrass me like that? And they quit church. Wow. You have an embarrassment all by yourself. I don't need you to embarrass me. I embarrass myself. It is the grace of God that you have something to see in me. There ain't nothing in me worth seeing. Nothing worth knowing. If you know something, see something, it's because the hand of the Almighty God is doing it in me. The four things I want to have with the Lord's against you. And they are for you when they become for you, number one, learn to enjoy God's guidance. Amen. It's a behavior that you must learn. What I've discovered is that everything we do in this world, we learned it. You learn to hurt, to, to be angry. You, everything that you are, you learn it. And when God wants to do something for his glory, you must learn to enjoy God's guidance. Where he tells you to go, if it when it doesn't make sense to you, be there. Elijah, go to the group, Cherith, because I have a GPS that I put on some birds, and the only location that they're going to land is the brook Cherith. If you are not at brook Cherith, you're going to die. You better be where I'm guiding you, because I've got other resources that are locked down on where you must go and enjoy me whilst I supply you. In order for the Lord to be for you, learn to enjoy God's guidance. Because there are moments where God will let you know, get on the boat and go on, and I'll catch up with you. And if it was me, I would have said, so how are you going to catch up with us? <laughs> then God simply said, don't worry about it, just learn to enjoy my guidance. They had never seen Jesus walk on the water. But if they were in that enjoyment of wherever they're going and the wind was coming in, guess what? Jesus comes walking on the water. In fact, the Bible says Jesus wanted to pass them. He wasn't coming to the boat. He was about to pass them. And he saw them panicking and he went over to where they were. And when he got there, he says, hey, be of good cheer. And then Peter says, Lord, if it is you, that's what the English version says, but the Greek says, Lord, since it is you. Peter was not doubting, he was not an if in Jesus' words. He was not saying, if it is you, then let me come. No, Peter says, let's just lock this thing down. Since it is you, beat me to come to you, watch this, 
and Jesus simply said, come. Do you know that all 12 of them could have stepped out of the boat because Jesus never said, come Peter, come John. He simply gave them the ability based on their faith and trust in him. All of them could have stepped on the water for the word of God. But because of fear, it's only Peter who did it. And then Jesus says, since Peter you did that, since Peter you did that, since you did that, Peter, let me show you what else I can do. <laughs> and then the Bible says, Pete started going down. And Jesus said, it's not just walking on the water, I, I can hook you up out of the water. <laughs> and Peter said, help! And Jesus said, come on now, let me hook you up. I just wanted to show you that I can make you walk on it, I can make you sink in it, I can bring you up on top of it, as long as you follow my guidance. The second thing you discover, when the odds are for you, learn to, to experience God's grace. It was by the grace of God that they were out of Egypt. Some of us forget that we are who we are by the grace of God. Have a preacher by the grace of God. You sing by the grace of God. You read your Bible in the morning by the grace of God. Continue experiencing the grace of God and you're going to be patient with people. Continue to experience the grace of God and you share with people. See, never get to a place where you think that anything you have is by some happenstance of you doing something. Everything we got is by the grace of God. That's why we keep on thanking Him because we are getting favor that we don't deserve. The day you think you deserve it, justifiable entitlement comes in. And when justifiable entitlement comes in, you know what's going to be best out of that. Pride is going to come. That's the next thing that's going to come in. Learn to experience the grace of God. The same God who took me out of Egypt is the same God who made me sit right here. Pharaoh is coming, and I don't know how he's going to do it, but he will do it again. I may not know when, I may not know how, but since I'm a grace man, somebody say grace man, I'm a grace woman, God is going to bless me. Some of you are looking at me right now, you don't deserve this house you have, but grace gave you one. Some of you are not even the best parent in the house. Oprah is a billionaire, but it's no kids. You have no billions, but you have a couple. Come on, talk to me. Here it is by the grace of God. Somebody died younger than you. You're older, don't have money, but by the grace of God, you're still taking off. Everything we are is by the grace of God. When the odds are for you, learn to experience God's grace. And the third point, when the odds are for you, expect God's glory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Expectation is a very powerful thing. And let me tell you something, God will always deal with your life based on your expectation. That's what the Bible says you don't have because you don't. The truth of the matter is we don't ask because we don't expect. <laughs> see, see, I can, I, I've got my friend here, uh, my good friend, good, wonderful elder friend, uh, uh, elder, my ruler here, please stand, please stand, I'll make you popular today, come on, elder, you're already popular. His son comes over here, his, his son, Lord, come on, come on, let me, let me just say something. I want to talk about expecting God's glory. You know, he's a good friend, come on, come, come, come right here, elder, today, you're preaching with me, let's do this. He's a good friend of mine. Had a crusade in Minnesota many, many years ago. And uh, he wasn't even in his church, but he started coming in, you know, uh, supporting his sister church like he's doing today. And the people in that church just, uh, you know, have you ever had people who invite you and then they treat you bad? <laughs> and some of the people who do that are preachers. You go to a church and you preach. I don't know whether people say better. I don't think there's any better preacher. But you just preach different. That the people get excited and fill out the church all three weeks. And the preacher gets human. And, and so the, the elder said to me, Pastor, you don't have to worry about anything. He said, What do you mean? He said, Man, 
we're going to take her back on Friday night to the airport, and we're here. Ever since that day, wherever I go, he's in Texas right now, wherever I go, that's the first family that always says to me, man, you've got a bedroom in our house. Yeah. Not only that, I did a meeting, and I was in their city, and he gave me his Lexus, beautiful car. He said, man, don't get no car, here's your car. All week long, just do what you want to do. What am I saying? Let me say this to you. When I come to Elder now, next time, because of our relationship, my expectation level is high. There are some people in this world that you don't expect anything from. I will walk to the airport for me to fly out here before I ask five dollars from you. But if I call him, he's not going to say, Pastor, I'm going to give you the money. Where are you at? Just, just, please send me your location. We're getting you up and we keep it on going. Here's where I want to take you, just for a moment. Thank you, Elder. Here's where the kicker is. You learn to expect the glory of God based on how God deals with you. How has God been dealing with you? One author says, we have nothing to fear about the, what? the future, lest we forget how God led us in the world. In the past, he's the same God who gave darkness to Egyptians and gave light to the Israelites. He's the same God who killed every firstborn of the Egyptians and he delivered every firstborn of the Israelites. He's the same God who turned the wall of Egypt into blood and fresh living water for the Israelites. That same God, I can expect glory from him when the odds are against me because in reality they are always for me. Say, I don't say that. You know, I, I lose my mind when I start thinking. <laughs> what are you expecting from that? You know. By the time you got into your car to come to, to this church today, you had already rewarded yourself for what you're going to get. What were you expecting? As you drove on the highways and byways and truck lines, coming to church, what is it that you're expecting? Pastor, does God still do miracles? Member, do you still expect God to do miracles? See, some of us don't expect much. And that's why we're weeping little. When you expect much, you're going to attempt much. And because we attempt little, we accomplish little. You don't have to change your money. You just need to change your expectation. The Israelites here there are, they are parked there, and God says, I'm going to get some glory out of this bridge. In order for them to come out, all they've got to do is expect God's glory. If he was with us, all this way to this point, truly God has got his hand in this. So wherever you are in your life today, and then the last one that I'll let you go, here it is. <laughs> God had told them, I'm taking you to the promised land. No matter the odds, no matter the spot you're in, here it is. Learn to embrace God's guarantee. <laughs> In other words, if he says it, you better believe it. Learn to embrace it. Mary, come over here. Well, Pastor, I'm right here. Well, you saw me with the child. And Mary says, wait a minute. How can that be? Seeing that I'm a virgin. But I like what she says furthermore. She says, but let your, you know, I'm your servant. You do yours. In other words, I embrace your guarantee. I don't know how you're going to do this thing, but I, 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 I embrace the fact that the Savior of the world is going to come through me. That's why it's very powerful for you to start celebrating the promises of God. Every promise of God is the guarantee of God that is going to happen. Wherever God's promise is, God's power is. Wherever God's power is, God's person is. In other words, if you just have the promise, you have the power, you have the presence. If God tells you I'm coming again, 
like he told us is coming again, embrace that guarantee. Yes. It don't matter how politically this world is turning upside down, how the fires, wherever they are, doesn't matter how chaotic the world becomes, I am leaning on the guarantee of God that is coming again. Yes. It may look like it's not happening like he said it will, but I wish I could control the details. Well, I cannot. All I got is the guarantee of God. One thing I like as a father, I love being a father. One thing I love about being a father is when my kids remind me of what I said. <laughs> oh, I love that. I, I just love my, my kids. If they were here, you would ask them, "Well, what, what does a father do?" I, I, I defined myself. I, 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 you know, I, my kids must know what to expect. Can I get a witness? But if I don't put boundaries on what I do, then my kids will just, you know, they, make, they mistake me for God. <laughs> so I put my boundaries on what they know. I protect, provide, and educate. If you look for my kids, they'll let you know. What does your father do? Protect, provide, and educate. So I preach in the car, I preach at the school, I preach everywhere. I'm educating. Someone said, I'm within my territory. And one thing I like is to hear my kids say, Daddy, you know you protect? Yes. And the moment they do that and then they qualify with the request, you don't know how it makes me feel. Even when I'm down and I don't want to do it, but the fact that my child expects me to do it. I'm just here to encourage somebody. I don't know what it is that God has put on your life. Some of the assignments God gives us, they are painful assignments. Some places where God takes us to, you really wonder, how can a loving God let Pharaoh come after me? And yet God is saying, I want to make sure that the memory of Pharaoh is erased forever. And the only way I can do it is for him to come as if he's going to catch you and then I'm going to cross you over and I'm going to shut him in and I'm going to make sure the waves bring his dead bodies to the sideway wall so that you can start singing a song in chapter 15, praising God for what he has done. If you're here today and you want to say, wow, all my life I've been trying to run away from the wars. But it's time for me now to Ask the Lord to give me eyes that can see Him. Ask the Lord to give me ears that can hear Him. As they brought those men and women, boys and girls, all the way from Africa to this place and many other places as slaves. They brought them in and as they came in, you remember, they, it was painful. They were powerful kings and queens and princes. These were not just ordinary people. This came in, these were conquered tribes and conquered chieftainships. And when they were coming in, there were people with power and authority. That's why they could survive the journey on the sea as long as it took, because they were just bold people. Yeah. And when they came over, here it is, when they came over, the odds were against them coming from a place where there was no snow. They had never seen snow at all. And as they were walking with chains on their on their necks and their shoulders locked one to another, as they were walking and their feet bleeding from the coldness of, of that chilly cold, and as they were walking, leaving some bloody footprints because it was painful. It was and they were animals to their characters. One of the one who was up front started the song. And yet when you looked into the snow, it was a bloody footprint. And yet they didn't see blood. They went beyond the blood and they saw a shoe. Wherever the shoe was, the shoe they saw is the shoe I got. They saw their blood footprint, but they expected God to do more. Yeah. I've got a shoe. Yeah. You got a shoe. Yeah. And all of God's children got a shoe. They've never been in church like church was taught by the white uh, slave masters and when they took them to church, they took their own sermons that they were using to imprison them in order for them to free themselves. And they started singing, swing law, sweet cherry law. I mean, they were singing in corn, in cotton field and, and corn field. And instead of complaining, they knew something. The odds are always for you as long as God has permitted you to be in I remember you may have forgotten it was in 2008 when the dream of the slaves became a reality. 
how they affected it was 2004, when the dreams of the slaves were shaking the nation. When the skinny, tall, funny, look well, cute looking, funny man, guy came out to the convention and he was the king of nigga, had big old ears that he could not mistake him for who he was. But when he got up, just the dream of the slaves, and he gave his speech that throughout the nation we called each other. We say, Who is this guy called Obama? Now, who is this guy? Where does he come from? And in two years' time, God honored the prayers of the slaves as he became the senator, the only cookie in the house. And when he was there, two years later, I remember, I know some of you have forgotten because they put amnesia like that. But I expect the, 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 the I saw expect the guarantee of God. I remember on that day, November the 4th, and he was announced that this man, Barack Obama, had won the president. Anybody remember that? I remember the suit he had. I remember the dresses his daughters had. I remember the dress his wife had. And they walked on stage just cool like that. Somebody say amen. And he did just the guarantee of God. This God who puts us in places and produces in us the best thing out of us. It's time for you to know that he, for he is forever with you, no matter what it is that's against you. Yeah. 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 Just time to celebrate his guidance. Yeah. I don't know what's happening with your job, but thank God for his guidance. Yeah. Yeah. As you go to talk to my girl Ruth, she will let you know, man, I just had to go and pick food for my mother-in-law. I just went to a field, man, looking for food. It was a horrible job, but I had to feed my mother-in-law. And when you read the book of Ruth, it was through what she was doing that Boaz heard about her. And she said, Boaz, why are you doing this kind of stuff? Well, in fact, it was here just doing what she was doing. That Boaz said, favor, just drop some stuff for her. She was picking for food in a field that was going to be her field and her workers one day. You gotta learn to start knowing that God is not here. You are not God. I am not God preaching. I have fears, but God doesn't have fear. He's leading us somewhere. So someone said today, want to say, Pastor, God has been guiding me and taking me to a place. And I really need prayer for me to just, I want, I want to, I want to give God freedom to be God in my life again. You've been panicking, running all over, please thank you so much. And you've been going all this kinds of afraid, thinking that God is against you, but for the first time you want to say, you know what, preacher, I don't know what it is that I'm going through. I don't know what it is that I'm going through. I mean, Corby didn't know that he would become a legend like this. He was good. But his death has made this guy immortal. I mean, you can't say nothing now. We're not even talking about the, 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 the greatest of all time. No, we are actually calling him the greatest of all time. If the Michael Jordan has to say that, why? I mean, sometimes the thing you think is against you is the only thing that can promote you. So you're here today and you want to say, Lord, I want you into my life. If my brother could tell the story of coming from Malawi, from fish, uh, 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 fishing, to Loma Linda, professor. And that's not only him. Every one of us in here is a trophy of grace. Yeah. Every one of us, if you look over our shoulders, and if you look back over our lives, come on, talk to me, somebody. We know that God has been good to us. So today, I want to say, Lord, I want you to come back and call us again. Come and take over, Lord. Come and take over. I, I just want to give myself back to you. Lord, Lord I, I thank you for the blessings you have blessed me with. I thank you for the challenges you have given me. Lord, I want to thank you for what I go through that I can't explain. But I'm sure I want to thank you for your guarantee that I am in your agenda. And if you ever want to understand if that's your need in the prayer. You want to say, well, Pastor, I just need it. Pray that my relationship with God get revived. And the doors of the church are open and somebody's here who may want to say, Pastor Preacher, I just want you to understand, I need Jesus in my life again. I want to accept him as my personal Savior. Anybody? You know, I just want to hook up with Jesus. Let me tell you something. There's something about Jesus. And I tell people everywhere I go, 
People in the world are running away from the church because we people who come to church, we are not representing church life. People want to go where people are going. If we are glad about our found salvation in Jesus Christ, it will cause somebody else to come over to where we are. Brothers in the room, when you find a good barber, it's easy for you to pass him around. Is that fair to say? I mean, just a good barber. You tell somebody, man, I found this guy. It's a good spot. Sisters in the room, if you find a good person who can do good hair, you pass it around in the mall. Anywhere you share it. What about Jesus? Stop complaining about the world. It's us. If we leave him up, if, if, if we let the world for real, he is 100, he is elite. I'm telling you, somebody's looking for what you got. So, if you're anyone who said, Look, I need to accept Jesus as my personal savior, is anybody in the house? May not have somebody, but I know this group will come. You are here and you want to say, Look, Pastor, I'm the backslider. In other words, I now just bear the name, but I don't have the power of this Christian thing. And I need you to pray for me. I want you to come to the front. Don't be ashamed of anybody. All of us go through phases in our lives. And, and here it is. You may still be coming to church, but deep down you have no connection. You don't sense him anymore. And you want to say, preacher, pray for me. I am here. Yes, I come to church. Sometimes you come to church, man. You don't even know why you are coming. And you are not the only one. Don't, don't complain about that. Sometimes you just come because it's, it's a ritual. Can I get an amen? This is all you know how to do on Saturday. If you don't come to church, you won't even go to the mall. I mean, this is in you that we just do this. But you want to say, God, I want a living, thriving relationship with you. I want a thriving relationship. I want to call on you, and I want you to answer me. And I want to hear you when you answer. Anybody? Yeah, just a backslider. You just want to, we're not going to ask what it is. You, you just want to say, I'm, I want to slide back in. Is there anyone? You all good? I'm going to ask us to join hands with one another as I pray. Join hands with the person next to you. It's the ritual. The couch of my church. We join hands, we touch each other a lot. Because I've learned in my life that you're not the only one going through what you're going through. That hand you're holding, that person needs your prayer. That person needs your support. The devil tells you you're the only one. As bad as you are, no you're not. You're not the only one. The person next to you is overcoming things that you are bound to doubt God for. And if you join in, just squeeze it a little bit. Just a little bit. Just let them know, man, look. You are not alone. You are never alone. And we pray, Father, I want to thank you so much for this celebration of This Is Us. Lord, I want to thank you for allowing us to understand that when the odds come against us, it's amazing that you being our God, you always have many ways where we see no way. But God, it's not the way that we must see, it is your presence that we must embrace. So I pray in a very special way that Lord, instead of worrying about things, in fact, you say to us, be anxious for nothing. God, we've been wondering why, how you could say that when anxiety is everywhere. Because Lord, you want us to enjoy your presence. You being there is greater than our expected outcomes in our situations. So I pray that Lord, you may revive us again. I pray that Lord, you may restore your glory in our lives again. Lord, as Pharaoh and all of our enemies come after us, we pray that, Lord, we used to think it was about us. But thank you for reminding us that, Lord, we benefit more when you receive more glory. So we're asking you to get glory out of our families, get glory out of our careers, get glory out of our lives. For, Lord, the more glory you get, the more joy we experience. May you bless the pastor of this church, heal him, God, completely. We call upon the name of Jesus and many prayers being offered on his behalf. That, Lord, you may restore him back to us so that he can do that which you have equipped this man to do. We are witnesses that God is special. And we pray that you may continue to bless him more abundantly. Break every chain, every box, anything that may want to limit him and lock him down. And I pray for the leadership of this church. 
that Lord as they go forward may all inspire joy in this church. May challenges, Lord, give breath to greater faith and greater hope and greater belief in each and every one of us. Have you all the way with us? May our names be written in that book of life. When you come again, Jesus, hook us up. We want to be like you. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And amen again. Let's put our hands together. Let's just thank God for his life, for his joy, and for all that he has for the church. You may be seen.